Please turn your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 to 24. 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 up to 24. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. A title for our study this morning is How to Deal with Doubt. How to Deal with Doubt. And I, when I say doubt, I'm referring to doubt in connection with our salvation. So how to deal with doubt. Have you ever been requested to lead in prayer and you declined because you felt that you were not worthy to come to God and request for anything from Him? Perhaps your conscience bothered you because you missed doing your quiet time in the morning. Maybe the night before you watched videos in the internet and slept late and so you had difficulty uh, to, uh, to wake up early and spend time with God. And as you continued throughout the day, things generally went wrong. You got into an argument with your wife for some petty thing. You were irritated with your children and yelled at them and said discouraging words because you were, you were going to be late for the service. Or perhaps during the week you did or said things that would disqualify you from ever receiving anything from God. You remember that lustful thought that passed through your mind the night before? You could have spent time with your daughter who needed counsel, but you were so indulging your flesh in some online game. And all of these things rush into your mind when you were requested to lead in prayer. And your conscience or the devil accused you and said, what kind of a Christian are you? What right do you have to come to God and ask for anything? Maybe some of you have experienced that. And thoughts such as these can hinder you from praying. It's hard to pray when you don't have assurance and confidence that God welcomes you and is willing to hear your prayers. Now John, our study for this morning, has something important to say about that particular situation. Here in 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 to 24. Just quickly, look at these statements that we find here in verses 19 and verses 21 and 22. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. By this we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. Great words. Know and then reassure our heart. Look at verse 21 and verse 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. So you see, just looking at those uh, verses, you realize, wow, our study today has something to do with uh, assurance of salvation. It has something to do with prayer. Now, in the previous chapters, John had written about the things that believers can use to help them know for sure that they have eternal life and that they are children of God and have real fellowship with Him. But you see, as a pastor, although he had masterfully handled these issues so that we, we, could, we could really know, I'm really saved, he gave us several tests. But because he is a pastor, he knows that in spite of all that he has said, there will still be some who feel condemned in their own eyes and therefore lack assurance. 
And the self-condemnation could be due to a number of factors. Let me just apply this for us now. No? Ang daming dahilan kung bakit posibleng mawalan tayo ng assurance or we feel condemned as we come before God. One is maybe because we've done some specific sin or sins such as those I mentioned a while ago or even others. Or it could be due to some physical condition. You know, sometimes if you're, if you're sick, if you're tired, it will affect your thinking. It will affect your prayer life. Your body is going to affect your, 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 your soul in, in some sense. It could also be because of a matter of disposition. There are some people who are just more introspective and given to melancholy than others. May mga tao, ang lit lang na bagay, masyado lang silang sensitive. Yung sa, sa pananaw ng Biblia at sa mata ng maraming tao, hindi mo malaking kasalanan yung nagawa mo. Bakit? Bakit? Hindi ka naman pumatay ng tao, ganito lang naman ang gawa mo. Then just confess to the Lord and move on, deal with it. But there are some people who are very, very sensitive. Their, their conscience is super sensitive. And so uh, because of that disposition, their, their, their assurance of salvation is easily affected. It may also be due to circumstances. Perhaps a person may be going through some trial or suffering. He may have lost a job. Or he may have lost mem a member of his family, his, sp his spouse, his, his, uh, a child, a friend. Or perhaps he's experiencing persecution. And because of that, parang feeling niya, uh, God's hand is heavy upon me. And so he could not approach God with confidence. Whatever the cause, the problem of lack of assurance, the problem of struggling when you pray, the problem of being condemned by your heart or by your conscience is real. Genuine Christians do at times fall into doubting their salvation and going through spiritual depression that affects their confidence and approach to God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous 20th century Scottish preacher, wrote about this problem in his book, Spiritual Depression. And this book is based on 21 sermons by him that he preached at Westminster Chapel in London in order to carefully and compassionately analyze the causes for spiritual depression among Christians and its solution. Now here in 1 John chapter 3 verses 19 to 23 or to 24 we have something similar to what Lloyd Jones did for his congregation. But of course this is not a human sermon but a divinely inspired solution to one of the common problems of Christians which is doubt and feeling condemned before God. So how do you deal with doubt and self-condemnation? And John addresses this problem of doubt regarding our salvation by answering three unstated questions that might arouse, arise in the believer's mind. You know, uh, I, I found it difficult to really outline this section. In fact, I checked several commentaries, and this is one of the most difficult portions of, of John to, 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 to just decipher uh, what's going into John's mind? How is the flow of this section? It, they really find it difficult. If the scholars, if the experts find it difficult, then I could understand myself having difficulty as well. So anyway, I tried to just imagine, uh, as I read through the text, these questions. I, I imagined there are three questions that could be raised and are answered by our text. Here are the three questions and it will serve as our guide or outline for today's study. First question is, how do we deal with doubt regarding salvation? How do we deal with doubt regarding salvation? And that question is answered in verses 19 and 20. Second question, why does it matter that we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? Why does it matter that we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? And that's found in verses 21 up to 23. And then, the third question, why is loving others God's condition for answering our prayers? 
And the answer to that question is in verse 24. Again, why is loving others God's condition for answering our prayers? Verse 24 is the answer. Now let's quickly go to the first question and find the answer to that question here in verses 19 and 20. The question is, how do we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? If you read verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3, you find John giving us two ways to help us deal with doubt and gain assurance. Two ways. The first is by looking back to what he just said concerning loving others. That's the first thing. The second is by looking forward to God's greatness and knowledge of all things. Actually, looking at God's faithfulness. That's found in verse 20. Now look at the first. Again the question, how do we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? First answer is, by evaluating our love life. By evaluating our love life. Now, of course, I, I want to clarify love life. It doesn't mean my, my crush or my wife or my children. No, I'm not talking about that kind of love. I'm not talking about the domestic kind of love or falling in love, as we would say it. I'm talking about love among brothers and sisters in the Lord. Love for other Christians. Look at verse 19. John says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. So the question again, how do we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? Here is the answer of John. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Now, what did he mean when he says, by this, by this? Now, he was referring to what he said previously. These two words, by this, refer to what John talked about in the previous verses that we find in chapter 3 verses 11 up to 18 that was our study last week in that section john discussed that genuine love for other believers expressed in deeds that meet their needs is a basis for assurance of salvation so malaman kung ikaw ay totoong ligtas o hindi i-check mo yung pag-ibig mo sa mga kapwa mong mananampalataya. Mahal mo ba sila? Totoo bang mahal mo sila? Look at verse, chapter 3, verse 14. It says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And the brothers there in this letter, more often than not, it refers to Christians those who belong to the faith. And then John says also, whoever does not love abides in death. If you don't love other Christians, then you remain spiritually dead. Verse 16 up to 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Of course, he's referring to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. That was the greatest love of all. Jesus dying for our sins. And John says, just as Jesus Christ did for us, we ought to lay down our lives for others as well, particularly for the believers. But then, of course, it doesn't mean all of us, as I mentioned before, are given the opportunity to actually lay down our lives for others. No, for John, this could simply mean self-sacrifice. Just doing good to others. Just expressing your love through... Uh, through uh, deeds of love, through actions. That's why he says in verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So that was our study last time. That's how you could know that you have transferred uh, from, the kingdom, from, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's how you know that you've passed from death to life. That's how you know you have eternal life by your love for other believers. That is the manifestation that you have the character of God, that you have eternal life. If you don't do that, it means you're spiritually dead. 
So now you look at verse 19, and John says, By this we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. So you see, it's by this, it's by that, that we can know that we are of the truth, that we are, we're, not, we're not living a lie. We're really in the truth. We really have, we have a relationship with the God of truth. We are truly connected to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We can be assured of our salvation. So John is saying, remember that when you doubt, when your conscience is bothering you, when your conscience is condemning you, that's one of the things you can do to address your doubt. Don't look at your failures. You have many, but rather look at those specific acts of love that the Holy Spirit of God within you has led you to perform. Tinan mo kung ano ginawa ng banal na spirito and let this be the evidence. Stop doubting. It is by doing righteous deeds, particularly deeds of love towards other believers, that we can assure ourselves that we are children of God. And so check your love life. See if love is present in you. Let me ask you these questions. Do you love God's people? Do you love to be with them in worship and in other occasions? Do you use your gifts and abilities to serve others? Do you pray for those who are in need? Do you visit those who are sick or in trouble? Do you see God's provision for you as a means to bless others who are in need? Do you extend yourself and concern yourself with the needs of others? Do you contribute cheerfully and regularly to support the needs of the ministry and the ministers? Are you accountable to others? Or, and do you see yourself as your brother's keeper? When somebody is caught in sin, do you feel a burden for him or for her and exert effort to restore them in a spirit of gentleness? Do you respect and submit to the leaders of the church so that they do their work with joy and not with groaning? Do you show compassion, consideration, forbearance, forgiveness, submission, patience, gentleness, kindness, and gratitude to other believers? Do you rejoice with those who rejoice, sympathize with those who hurt, and encourage the weak? Do you refrain from envying the possessions and gifts of others because you love them and want them to have the best? Those are some of the questions you need to ask. And if you could positively say yes to those questions, that is your habit of life, then these are indicators by which you could know that you are of the truth. By these specific acts of love, we know that we are rightly connected to and have fellowship with the true God. By this, we know that God has changed our hearts and converted us. By this, we know the Holy Spirit is in our hearts and moving in our lives. Hindi mo magagawa yun eh. You can't do that on your own. By nature, we, we're, we envy others, we hate others. You know, this is what is true to a person who does not have the Lord in his heart. Listen to the negative aspect. Let me share with you negative questions in connection with that. How do you know that love is absent in your life? Do you like to avoid God's people? Do you tend to be of an independent spirit? Parang ayaw mong kasama ibang tao, lalo na Christian. Do you often see yourself leaving worship service immediately? so that you do not have to be in fellowship with others, knowing their concerns and being involved in helping them? Do you believe that the money you worked hard for is something that you deserve to enjoy and you don't even care to share that with others? You might be thinking, pinagirapan ko to eh. Ako lang ang pwede mag-enjoy dito. Trabaho rin sila. Kung gusto nilang mag-enjoy din sa buhay. Do you tend to judge others and speak critically of them to other people? Do you gossip, recounting, and passing on the sins of others? 
Do you tend to say unwholesome words that bring down others instead of saying words that build them up? Are you always impatient and irritable, complaining and grumbling? Do you have resentment, bitterness, and an unforgiving spirit? Do you tend to manipulate other people for your own ends? Are you self-centered? Do you have selfish ambition? Do you love position, power, and praise? Is that your heart? Do you find that? And that is really what fills your mind and your heart. And when you're in a gathering such as this, actually you hate. You drag your feet to come here. Maybe you're a young person and the only reason you're attending a gathering like this is because your parents force you to attend. So the first thing you do when you come here is you look if there's look for someone you know and maybe your classmate and your barcada and you sit at the back and so when it's time to have something like this you're giggling at the back you're tickling one another and you're just into so many foolish things because you don't really love the church you don't love god you don't love the bible love other believers i remember when i was in high school as a Catholic seminarian there was someone I think is a Bible believing Christian he went to a group of seminarians Catholic seminarians I was there and he he was he he brought his Bible along and he started to share the gospel with others you know the first thing that I felt was I wanted to run away from his presence I didn't want to hear anything that he said I didn't want to know him. I didn't want to have fellowship with him. I hated Christians. I hated Bible believers. Is that your heart? If you have that kind of a heart, you do not have eternal life. You do not have fellowship with this God who gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. You are still spiritually dead. Don't ever imagine that you're on your way to heaven. No, you're on your way to hell. And this is what John is telling us here. By this you know, by this you know, by this you know that you have a good relationship, that you have fellowship with God by your love for other believers. So that is the first way that you deal with doubt and gain knowledge that you are truly saved. Check your life and see if you have love for other believers that is habitually expressed by good deeds in order to bless them. Now the second way that you deal with doubt and know for sure that you are saved is by recognizing God's grace and faithfulness. And that's what John says here in verse 20. He says, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. So here John is shifting the basis of our assurance away from our good works to God's faithfulness. Oh, hindi na lang yung sarili ninyo. Sabi niyo na una, o tingnan niyo sarili niyo, may love ba kayo? Okay, pero ngayon dagdagan ko pa na isa. Tingnan natin kung anong tingin nyo sa Diyos. No? Huwag nang tingnan ng nyo ang sarili nyo. Tingnan nyo ngayon ang Panginoon. Sabi niya sa verse 20, For whenever our heart condemns us, what John says here may refer to any occasion when a believer feels his heart, or some Bible teachers would say his conscience, is condemning him and he begins to doubt about his relationship with God. So, ano mang sitwasyon? It may be, as I said, due to some specific sin that we had committed, and maybe we didn't realize the grave consequences of those sins, of that particular deed that we've done. Maybe we woke up late in the morning, we got into traffic, and so missed our flight. Naiwan ka ng aeroplano, and that was going to the U.S. And you had your family with you, and you have, of course, to pay a lot more to get to the next flight. And as a result of that, your wife is angry, your children are angry. And so it's really striking you. You're really conscience-stricken. Or maybe 
You were being led to share the gospel to a friend, but you were lazy or fearful at that time. And then an hour later, your friend died. And so you feel so guilty that you couldn't forgive yourself. Maybe you even remembered the word of the Lord to Ezekiel the prophet when God said, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to, to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So maybe you remember these passages and you think, Oh Lord, that's for me. And so you're you're being condemned by Satan, the accuser of the brethren. You're being condemned by your own conscience. Whatever the reason that you feel being condemned by your heart, John says that you may still know that you are of the truth and reassure your heart. How? By looking to God and recognizing His grace, His mercy, and his faithfulness and here is how John presents this in verse 20 he says God is greater than our heart and he knows everything what do these statements God is greater than our heart and he knows all things mean and how do they deal or how do they help us deal with doubting hearts and troubled consciences when they condemn us Papano? Paano makakatulong ito? Well, when John says, God is greater than our heart, what he means is that God's grace and comfort in salvation are greater than the accusations or condemnations that come from our heart or our conscience. Mas higit ang Panginoon Diyos doon. Our conscience could sometimes be lenient, but sometimes they could be, they could be too severe. Talagang grabe, as I mentioned a while ago, depending on your disposition, there are some people who are easily given to introspection. Pag konting may nagawa silang kasalanan, ang lalim na, lagi nilang iniisip yung sarili nila, lagi nilang sinasabi, bakit ko nagawa ito? Siguro hindi talaga ako mana ng palataya. Siguro hindi talaga ako kristyano. So their conscience is bothering them. But then, John says, when that is happening, look to God. God is greater than your conscience. God's grace is greater than your sin. No matter how much your heart may condemn you, God still welcomes and forgives you if you seek His forgiveness and you cast yourself upon His mercy. Remember 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, from all unrighteousness. I remember I have a friend many years ago when I was a young minister in the Lord, and this guy is a brother of another pastor who's also my friend. And this person had such a hypersensitive conscience he commits one small sin, and I'd talk to him, and he would look so depressed. And I'd ask him, what's your problem? And he would say, I have committed the unpardonable sin. I had to study that passage, what that meant. And I, I, for me, at least my view is, Christians do not commit the unpardonable sin. That's a sin that the Pharisees, in the face of fullness of light jesus christ was actually there he was there to speak the words from god he was there to do miracles and yet these pharisees because of their envy because of the hardness of their heart accuses jesus as doing these things from the devil and that was the unpardonable sin they were saying that's not the holy spirit that's from the devil they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And this friend of mine thought he committed the unpardonable sin. And I told him, no, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. God is greater than what you've committed, whatever that may be. You trust in the Lord, you believe in Him, then 
cast yourself upon His mercy. His promises, if you confess your sins, He is faithful. He's faithful. That means he, he will be true to His promise. There will never be a time wherein He won't forgive if you are sincere, if you truly humble yourself before Him, if you're relying upon the perfect work of Jesus Christ on the cross to cleanse you, to forgive you. And then it adds, and He is just to forgive. When He forgives, God doesn't just, God isn't just moved emotionally. God doesn't say, okay, I'll forget everything that you've done. I won't imagine that you committed this heinous crime. I won't imagine this because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a consentidor, as we would call it. Hindi po ganun ang ating Panginoon Diyos. Hindi siya consentidor. Maraming mga lolo, mga lola, pag may ginawang kasalanan yung kanilang apo, kahit ano pa yun, sige lang apo, okay lang, okay lang. Ma lola, papaluin ako ni mama. Huwag mong paluin yung apo ko ha. Poproteksyon na na. And then sabihin ng anak, yan problema, mami eh. Kasi lagi mong binibigay yung gusto ng apo mo eh. Kaya, ayan, namimihasa tuloy. Natawag doon, consentidor. That is not God. Hindi po ganun ng Panginoon Diyos. He is just. He is just. Ibig sabihin, that means when you sinned, there is payment for your sin. But justice is manifested this way. You don't pay for your sin. Jesus Christ does. He died for our sins. That's why the Bible says, He is just when He forgives. Satan could not say, God, how could you forgive him for his sin? He must pay for his sin. God says, He already did. But through my son, Jesus. And so Satan stops his accusing, his accusations, because he knows Jesus paid for our sins. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our sin as believers is not greater than God's power to forgive. I remember I've committed a sin that I felt, Lord, how could I do this? I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, but how could I do, how could I commit this sin? And at first I had difficulty to come to the Lord. And then I remembered 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 that says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So that's the reason why this letter was written. 1 John was written so that we don't sin. But then he adds, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. My conscience was starting to condemn me. What kind of a Christian are you? You're not a Christian. What kind of a pastor are you? You're not a pastor. You're a hypocrite. My conscience or Satan was starting to accuse me. And then... I remembered, yes, Lord, you don't want me to sin, but you said, but if I sin, but if I fall into sin, God says, you have an advocate, you have a defense attorney with the Father, and this is Jesus Christ, the righteous, the righteous one. Unlike lawyers today, when they defend you, they have to make up a story. They have to lie so that your sin or your crime will not be as big as it really looks like. When Jesus Christ starts to defend you, He will be telling the truth. It will be based on righteousness. And because He is perfect and God is perfect, His defense will be acceptable to God. And so we could approach God with confidence. We could also hold on to Romans 8 verse 1 that says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
We could also hold on to Romans 8, 31 up to 39 that says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Jump to verse 37. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So that's what John means when he says, God is greater than your heart. Your heart, your conscience is accusing you because you've fallen into some particular sin. But God is greater than your heart. Come to Him. Humble yourself. He's more than ready to forgive you. His son died for you. He paid for all of your sins. And so you could come to him and be restored quickly. Now John also says, God knows all things. God knows all things. How can that bring assurance of salvation? Well, that statement, God knows all things, means that God knows all of the believer's failures, God knows all of the believer's deeds. God knows all of the believer's successes and sins. He knows all of them. He knows that we've failed some way or another. You remember Proverbs 24, verse 16. Let me remind you of that. It says, The righteous falls seven times but rises again. Yes, we're saved by the Lord. Yes, we have eternal life, but we're not yet perfect. We await glorification when the presence of sin is going to be removed and we will have the body of Jesus Christ, we'll have the perfect mind of Jesus Christ, we'll have the perfect character of Jesus Christ, we'll never sin. But that will have to await the future until Jesus Christ returns. But now, yes, we're already justified. Yes, we're being sanctified. But we're not yet perfect. And so we could be like this righteous man in Proverbs falling down seven times. Now, it's not a habit. It's not something that we habitually do or we like to do. When we do fall into sin, we're conscience stricken. But God knows. God knows all things. And so that is what it, that is what it means. God knows all things. The, how does God's omniscience help us deal with our doubts regarding our salvation? Well, perhaps uh, this illustration will help. You remember what happened to Peter? When Jesus Christ was going through litigation before the religious and the civil courts, what did Peter do? Peter denied him three times. Before this occasion, Jesus Christ told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. And Peter said, no, Lord, I'll never do that. And then it happened. He fell not just once, but three times he denied Jesus Christ with full knowledge. He knew and he, 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 was, he was prepared. He said, no, I'll never do that, Lord. But he did fail. He sinned. And when the eyes of Jesus and the eyes of Peter met, Peter was so convicted of sin that he ran away from, from uh, Jesus' presence and wept, wept severely. So he denied the Lord three times. Now after Jesus rose again from the dead, Jesus revealed himself to his disciples, including Peter. And in John chapter 20, we find one of those appearances of Christ to his disciples. And listen to the conversation between Peter and the Lord. John 20, beginning in verses 15 up to 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Why did Jesus Christ have to ask Peter three times, Do you love me? Because three times, Peter denied Jesus. Jesus wanted him restored. So three times he asked, do you love me? Giving him the opportunity to express his heart. But Jesus knew everything about him. He knew he would fail. He knew he would, Peter would deny him three times. In fact, Jesus Christ prayed, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus knew. And so this is what it means. When you feel condemned, remember, God knows everything. God knows you're going to fail. God knows you're going to sin in that particular area. But He also knows your heart. He knows that you've expressed love for other believers. He knows that that is the direction of your heart. That is the trajectory of your heart. He knows that's really your habit. You really love other believers. He knows that the Holy Spirit has really transformed your heart. You're delivered from bondage. But there are instances that you do fall into sin. It happens. We're not perfect, as I said. But God knows. You say, Lord, you know that I love you, but I failed here in this area. Now that is so comforting to know that God knows all things. He knew beforehand that you were going to fail. But He already provided the way for that sin to be forgiven. When Jesus Christ died for our sins, He did not just die for your sins from your birth until you received Christ as your Savior. The sacrifice of Jesus covered everything from your birth until your death. All of the sins that you have committed and will ever commit have already been included in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God knows all things. And so that is how you assure your heart before God that He loves you, that you are His child. So again, how do we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? John's answer is found in verses 19 and 20. First, remember your expressions of love for other believers. Look at your life. Check your love life. Do you love other Christians? Is this your habit? If that is so, that is evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. And then secondly, if your heart accuses you of some sin that you've committed and, you're, you, and Satan says, no, God doesn't love you anymore, remember the faithfulness and the grace of God in verse 20. So that's how you deal with doubt regarding your salvation. We come to the next question. Now, why does it matter that we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? Why does it matter? The answer is in verses 21 up to 23. And there are two reasons that I see here. First, it matters that we deal with doubt regarding our salvation because assurance of salvation will give us confidence in our access to God. You have to deal with your doubt. You need to be sure about God's love because that is what will give you confidence in your access to God. Look at verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So that's the reason why we have to deal with doubt. Because if our heart does not condemn us, 
We have confidence before God. You see, it's, it's so important. Now, please don't misunderstand verse 21. Verse 21 does not mean confidence before God in the day of judgment. You have that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. It says, John says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. But verse 21 here in chapter 3 is not talking about the future. It's not talking about shrinking away from the presence of Jesus Christ in shame at His coming. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about confidence in your standing before God, and therefore you have access to Him. The word confidence here, one commentator says, in ancient times, the word rendered confidence stood for the most valued right of a citizen in a free state to speak his mind unhampered by fear or shame. You're free to talk. You're free to express what is in your mind. And so that is what John is saying here. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we could speak freely to God, we have confidence to approach Him, we need not fear anything. In John 16, verse 23, Jesus Christ said, let me read from the New Living Translation, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly, and He will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Look at the wonderful promise of Jesus. God is saying, you have direct access to God. And maybe some people are so afraid to come to God, they will always just go to Jesus. They will never pray, Our Father. You know that Our Father, I was trying to I was learning elementary Greek and I discovered that is what they called vocative. It means when you say our father, it's directly addressing the person. Our father, you're, you're really talking to God. Some people maybe are so afraid of God, they can't even talk to God directly and say our father. They, have to, they can only go to Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, Jesus, please help me. Please, Jesus, go to the Father and tell the Father, this is my request. Jesus Christ says, no, you can go direct to the Father in my name. In my name. You have to deal with your doubt. You have to deal with condemnation because that will give you free access to God. There are some people here, they couldn't go straight to God. They have to Go and look for the pastor and request for the pastor to pray for him. Pastor, pwede ba pakipray ako? Kasi ganito problem. Eh, ba't ikaw? Hindi ka magpray ng diretso. Eh, nahihiya ako kay God eh. Ikaw na lang, malakas ka doon sa taas eh. Ako, mahina ako doon eh. Ba't ka mahina? Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, you don't have to be afraid. God wants you to be confident. God wants you to go straight to Him through Jesus Christ. And so that's the reason why you have to deal with doubt. Because when you have assurance of salvation, you will have confidence in your access to God. Now John even goes beyond that. There's a second reason why he wants us to deal with this issue of doubt. Because assurance of salvation will give us confidence that our prayers will be answered. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. You see, whatever we ask, we receive from Him. It is not only confidence in being able to approach God freely and speak our mind to Him that should delight us, but even beyond this, we could have confidence that our prayers will be answered. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. 
Imagine it's such a great statement. This is a, a statement that, that, that claims that your prayers will be answered. My dear friends, do you know what it means to talk to the Lord, to share your concerns, and then answer, receive specific answers to your prayers? Have you ever experienced that? Maybe some of you are praying just generally and so you never experience it. You say, God bless my family, God provide all of my needs, solve all of my problems, amen. You don't even know if God answered any of them. But when you have a problem, a specific concern, and you pray for that specific thing, and then you see God directly answering that, look at what it could do to your, to your confidence, to your joy. It will really bring you such a joy that surpasses all understanding because you know there is a God who hears. There is a God who cares. There is a God who really answers prayers. But if you have doubt, if you have condemnation, you'll never experience that. So John says, deal with the, that condemning heart. Deal with your assurance of salvation. If you have assurance of, of salvation, you can be confident of receiving answers to your prayers. Now, there is a condition. You find here, there's a condition in order for that to happen. In order for you to receive answers to your prayers, the condition is, and there too, you are to obey His commandments and do what pleases Him. You are to obey His commandments and do what pleases Him. So that means, it, this doesn't mean whatever we ask, that we can just ask for anything. Lord, mamatay na sana yung kapitbahay namin. You don't pray that. Because you know that's wrong. That's not obeying the command to love one another. Oh, for those who didn't understand, when you pray, Lord, kill my neighbor. You don't pray that way. Lord, I pray, let me win in lotto. God won't answer that prayer because he who does not work does not eat. You're lazy and you're covetous. And you don't understand the principles found in the book of Proverbs pertaining to success and pertaining to wealth. So when you say whatever we ask, you will, you will be asking according to God's will. But how will you receive the prayers, the, the answer to your prayers, when you obey His commandments and do what pleases Him? What are the commandments? John is going to lay that down for us in the next verse. We'll look at that in a little while. But it also, John also adds, and we do what pleases Him. That could be the same thing as saying, obeying His commands or doing what pleases Him. It could be equivalent, or it could mean obey His commands or specific things that you do. In the next verse, we'll see that. That's have, putting your faith in Jesus Christ and loving others. And then what, uh, doing what pleases Him, that could mean doing all of those things that are not specifically commanded in Scripture. But you do it because you love the Lord. There are, many, there are many things that are not specifically laid down, do this, do that. But you're doing it because you love the Lord. And John says, when, that, when you fulfill those conditions, then whatever you ask, you will receive from Him. Now again, what are those commandments specifically? Verse 23, and this is His commandment that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. So the first command is that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the, the verb tense here is a, is, is a once and for all kind of belief. It, it it has the sense of total and complete commitment. To believe in the name of Jesus Christ is the same as to believe in His person. To believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. To believe that this, this Jesus uh, became man and dwelt among us. It is to believe that this Jesus is the, 
the Savior of the whole world, to believe that this Jesus lived a perfect life in this world and He died for our sins. It is to believe that this Jesus took upon Himself our sins and not only our sins, but the judgment of God, the wrath of God, so that, so that His anger may no longer be directed towards us. To believe in Jesus Christ means to believe that He died and He was buried, but on the third day He rose again from the grave. It is to believe that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him. It is to believe that this Jesus ascended back to the Father and is right now seated at the right hand of God. It is to believe that this Jesus will return one day to judge the living and the dead. It is to believe that this Jesus will usher in His kingdom. It is to believe that Jesus is going to be in His eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. It's to believe all of that. But more than that, it is to entrust your life to Him. It is to say, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. It is to say, you are my Lord in its fullest sense. Not just with our lips to say, Lord, Lord, but really in your heart you're submitted to Him. Do you really know Jesus Christ in this way? Have you really put your trust in Christ as your Savior? Is He truly your Lord? Are you trusting in Him for your salvation? Have you really decided to follow Him? The second command of God is that we love one another. Now, love here is interesting because it's in the present tense. It's an ongoing habit of the believer. As we learned before, loving is not just sentimental feeling. Loving here, as John says, we are not to love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. So that's what loving means. So a person who sees that he is transformed and the reason, the evidence that he is transformed is that he loves other believers, that is, then it means that he, has, he, he is obeying God's commands and it means that he could be confident he will receive answers to his prayers. So you see, when you really think about it, uh, believing in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and loving one another, when you really think about it, it's really one command. You cannot believe in Christ and not love the people of Christ. You cannot really love Christians if you don't really love Jesus Christ. You can't do that. So this is actually one command. You know, maybe it's like, what happened in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 up to 31, one of the scribes came up to Jesus, uh, or one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing, the disciples disputing with one another, and seeing that he, uh, the disciples and Jesus, and, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The way Jesus Christ said it, it's like the question is, which commandment is the most important of all? But the answer of Christ is divided into two. You are to love God with all of your heart and you are to love others as you love yourself. It's like Jesus trying to say, you cannot love God with all of your heart if you don't love others. You cannot love others as you love yourself if you don't love God. You have to experience this relationship with God. You have to be transformed in your life. I'm sorry. You have to be transformed in your life before you could love other people. And so this is just like one command. So that's the second question that is answered here by John. Why does it matter that we deal with doubt regarding our salvation? Because 
assurance of salvation will give us confidence in our access to God and because it will give us confidence that our prayers will be answered. Now, to go to the third unstated question that's answered by John, why is loving others God's condition for answering our prayers? Bakit, bakit kailangan mahalin natin ang ating kapwa? Why is that the condition for answering our prayers? There are two answers for this. Number one, because loving others proves that we have a vital relationship and fellowship with God. You know, it's like just going around again. We, we went back to our original idea that when you love God or when you love others, it means you're really transformed by God and really you you really have the character of god you really have the nature of god you really are transferred from spiritual darkness to to life spiritual death to eternal life and so loving others proves that we have a vital relationship and fellowship with god look at verse 24 whoever keeps his commandments abides in god and god in him so that's the reason why God is making our love for one another as His condition. Because if we love one another, then it means that we really have a relationship with God. It means we are really abiding in God, and it means that God is really abiding in us. There is real intimacy, there is real connectedness between the believer and God. It, it indicates our permanent union with God. We stay with Him. He stays with us. And He is unchanging in His presence with His people. So that's the reason why He makes love the condition. If you love, it means we have a relationship. Look at the next. The reason why He makes loving God a condition for answering our prayers because loving others shows that the Holy Spirit is really working in us. Look again at verse 24, the last statement there. It says, And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. What does that mean? Does it mean that by this we know that we are really, or that God is really in us because the Holy Spirit is testifying to our hearts that we are truly God's children, just like what Paul said in Romans 8, 15 and 16, when he wrote there, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. No, I don't think this is what this is trying to say. When it says, by the Spirit whom He has given us, we know that God abides in us, not because of the subjective work of the Holy Spirit in testifying to our spirits that we are truly children of God. I think what this is trying to say is, when it says, by the Spirit whom He has given us, we know that God abides in us, that means by the work of the Spirit in our lives. When the Holy Spirit enlightened us regarding our sin and gave us faith to put our trust in Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit resided in our hearts and transformed our lives, regenerated us. When the Holy Spirit moved upon our lives and delivered us from the clutches of Satan, from the, from the bondage of sin. And as a result, we have loved other believers. That is how we know that God abides in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. By the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit started to work in us, that we started to love others who are not our relatives. You know, for example, you have a sick brother or mother. They have a problem. And you need to pay 50000 in the hospital. That's easy for you to do because that's your mother or your father or your daughter or your son. But what if a member of the church who's not your relative, not in any way connected to you, but you heard that this person is in dire need, 
May malaking pangangailangan at kailangan niya ng 50,000 para maoperahan o para ma-address yung kanyang problema. And you, you have the money. You have savings. You have hundreds of thousands of pesos in the bank. And you say, 50,000. He said, you write, I'll write a check. Here is 50,000 for you. And you know that person won't even be able to pay you in return. And you still do it. Why? Because of love. How were you able to do it? Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You have the character of God. You have the love of God moving in your heart. That's why you could do it. And so this is the reason why God says, whoever keeps His commands, commandments abide in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. This is why loving others is God's condition for answering our prayers. It is our love for others that prove that we have a vital relationship and fellowship with God and it is the proof that we have the Holy Spirit really working in us. That's how we know. Now please do not misunderstand. When I say that we must love everybody, we must love believers, I am not saying that we will always be loving other Christians fully and perfectly or else we are not saved. No, I'm not saying that. Please do not misunderstand. There are instances wherein we will be failing to love other believers. But please do not forget, that is not the direction of your heart. If you are an unbeliever, you really don't care. You don't care about loving others. You're really indifferent. But if you're really a genuine Christian, you, you know in your heart you have a genuine concern for other believers. That is your direction. That is your desire. You want to please God. You want to express your love for other Christians. And then what happens when you fail, when you fall into sin? Well, you go to God and you say, Lord, I'm really sorry. Lord, please forgive me. I failed. Sometimes that really happens. Sometimes we fall into sin against one another. And it's so grievous. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It hurts the body of Jesus Christ. But again, as I said, if you're a genuine Christian, that's not a habit for you. But sometimes it does happen. When that happens, remind yourself again, Lord, you know me. You know my heart. I'm just, I'm just really angry now. But Lord, I know. I know, Lord, this is wrong. And you come to the Lord and you pray, Lord, please deal with my heart. I don't want to be always angry towards this brother or sister of mine. You know, when you're convicted of sin, when you're convicted of that bitterness, when you're convicted that there's anger, when you're convicted that you're running away from that brother or sister and you don't want to be reconciled and you want to just wait, when you feel convicted, it's an evidence the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. When you're humbling yourself and really pleading, Lord, please have mercy upon me. I know this is wrong. Please give me the grace. I want to be reconciled to this person, but Lord, I can't do it with my own strength. When you do that, that is evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in you. As I said, I know of a person. I, I talked with this guy in the U.S. And he knew that his relationship with his wife was wrong. He knew that he hated his wife. You know what he did? He said he even ran away from the church, didn't, no longer went to church, no longer prayed to God because he said, because I don't want to be reconciled to my wife. 
Because I know if I come to God, God's gonna change my heart, God's gonna give me love for my wife, then I have to live again for many years with my wife until death separates us. So he doesn't want that. You know, you know, obviously, the guy is not a Christian. But when in your heart you want to be reconciled, you know you've failed, but you pray, Lord, please have mercy upon me. You know the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. I want to close with this prayer from John Macduff. I have this small booklet that contains all of his morning prayers for one month. Once in a while, I would open it to a certain date. If today is 22, I'll read uh, his morning prayer for this day, this date. And I always find his prayer very, very deep and very refreshing. But you'll be surprised with his prayer. It's unlike the prayers of many people today who have a loose uh, relationship with God, who, who don't take God seriously. This guy really takes God very seriously and takes sin very seriously. Listen to his prayer. This is John Macduff, and uh, this is his morning prayer for consistency of walk. Listen to his prayer. O Lord, you're the heart-searching and thought-trying God. To you all hearts are open. From you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of my heart this day by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. I would seek to begin its hours with you. May all its business and employments be perfumed with the fragrance of the morning sacrifice. O oh, you who are the great origin and end of all things, be to me the Alpha and the Omega of my daily being. May I feel existence to be a blank without you. May I feel that I can only be happy with when a sense of your favor and friendship and love is sweetly intermingled with life's duties. I come to you once more, now listen to this, an unworthy sinner to cast myself at my Savior's feet. What am I that I should have borne, that you should have borne with me so long? The acts laid down at the root of the trees might long ago have cut me down but i a guilty cumberer am still spared the retrospect of existence while a retrospect of patience and forbearance on your part is one of mournful rebellion and ingratitude on mine i have had a name to live but how much spiritual death in my best frames i have had a form of godliness but little have I lived out and acted out its power. More careful have I been to appear to be a Christian than really to be a Christian. How much unevenness in my walk, how much proclaimed and professed by the lip has been undone and denied in the life. I come this morning to ask anew for mercy to pardon and grace to help me, especially give me the grace of a holy consistency, doing all for your glory, having boldness to speak for you in the world. May my walk and conversation be the living evidence and expression of the sincerity and reality of inner life. Pardon me for the old English in many parts here, but what he's trying to say here is, Lord, please give me consistency of walk because I do not walk consistently the way you would want me. I am an unworthy sinner. The acts is ready to cut me down long ago and yet you spared me you've expressed your patience your forbearance though i have been rebellious i have been ungrateful i have a name that i'm a christian but you know it's only a form of godliness but i have denied its power that was that's what he's trying to say he's being honest before the lord He's saying, Lord, I failed in many ways. But what is his confidence to come to God despite of all of this? Because he knows that God is greater than his heart and God knows all things. 
He knows, Lord, you know my heart. I love you. But I have many, many times sinned against you. Lord, I can only trust in Jesus Christ. I don't rely on my good works. I rely upon you alone. Jesus Christ is my propitiation. Jesus Christ is my defense attorney. I have nothing to hold on to but Him alone and His perfect work for my sins. I want to speak to all of you again, my dear brethren. I want to speak to you who are young people here in our who are studying in our school. You've been exposed to, uh, to the gospel, some of you, for many years. But up to today, you still have not put your trust in Jesus Christ. And that is evidenced in your lack of love, lack of love for other Christians. Maybe the reason why you're here, as I mentioned, is because your parents brought you here and you had no choice. But the truth is, you really don't care. Dear kids, I want to tell you, you are on your way to hell. The wrath of God remains upon you. While you have an opportunity, please run to Him. I appeal to you as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive Jesus Christ while you have opportunity. And for you who are already believers, thank God for His grace. Don't abuse the grace of God, but really thank Him. Show your gratitude to Jesus by by loving others, by loving people in the church. Some of you have been with us for a long time, but when other Christians would talk about you or would, would mention your name, if I would mention you, what do you think about this person? They will never imagine you to be a person who loves other Christians. They never felt it. They know you have spiritual gifts. They know you could teach. They know you could do that. But you've never used your spiritual gifts in order to serve other believers. It's high time that you wake up, that you repent of your sin. You check yourself. Test yourself if you are really in the faith. Now, if you know in your heart that you really love the Lord, then let your actions prove that love by specific deeds of love. Show it. Share financially. Pray. Attend our prayer meeting to show your support that you really love the brothers and you really love the work of God. Do things specifically to prove that Jesus Christ is really in your heart and the Holy Spirit is really moving in you. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time that you've given us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray, please move upon the hearts of our young people, our students from SDGCA. They have been hearing the gospel many, many times, but I'm afraid, Lord, many of them, even up to now, are not yet saved. Lord, please grant them the gift of repentance and the gift of faith so that today they will really surrender their lives to Jesus and make Him Lord over all areas of their lives. Lord, apart from You, they cannot come to Jesus. God, Holy Spirit, please move now. Move upon all the unbelievers here. Help them, Lord. Touch their hearts so that they will, they will run to Jesus Christ while they still have opportunity. And for those of us who are already Christians, again, Lord, thank you because this relationship with you will never be destroyed. The abiding presence of your Spirit in our lives will never be taken away. This is eternal. The life that we receive from you is eternal. Our being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light is forever. 
this will never be undone. And so, Lord, thank you. Lord, we pray as an expression of our gratitude to you, help us to really love others. Thank you that your Holy Spirit will move upon us so that we can really do this. Thank you, Lord, that when we fall into sin, we could come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Thank you, you are faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we honor you and magnify you, and we love you, Lord. Thank you, O God. Lord, now I've shared your word. Again, do not allow your word to return to you without accomplishing the purpose for which you've sent it. For this we pray in Christ's most precious name. Amen and amen.